the Fair Park Bible Fellowship Church. We're located at 1321 Rowan Avenue right here in Dallas, Texas. You're welcome to come and join us any Sunday as our worship service begins at 11 o'clock where we begin to sing and lift up the name of Jesus. It is our hope today that you would be encouraged to serve him and to submit yourselves fully to him as we live in these last and very troubling days we need to have a right relationship with him that is defined by him within the word and so we are glad that you could join us today as we stretch our faith towards heaven father in the name of jesus we pray that you would open our hearts that we may hear a word from you that you would expand our understanding give us faith father that will cause us to stand firm in the face of very tumultuous and difficult times that our testimony of the reality of God will be seen in our uh, steadfast immovable commitment to the things of Christ amen amen men and women we've been studying uh, and we're getting back to our study today on theology proper theology proper is the study of God and his attributes theology proper focuses in on God the Father. We look at God the Father. We've studied a little bit about Christology, study of Christ. Now we're looking at God the Father. And as we look at God the Father, we're looking at God in his attributes and in his purposes and what God is doing even now in the earth. God has a purpose. And it's not incidental or accidental that you're sitting here today or watching us via Facebook. Uh, if you are a part of the family of God, you are a part of the purpose of God. God is at work and he is unfolding a plan that has been developed in the councils of eternity. Before there was even a creation, God had made a determination that we will be at this point in the history of mankind and in the history of the purposes of God in order to achieve that which God has predetermined to happen. And men and women, where we are right now, no matter how tumultuous things may be, God is not caught off guard. He is not looking and learning, but he is unfolding his purposes even before you and I. So as we look at this purpose, or the purposes of God and theology proper, there are several things that I think that ought to be... Uh, our ambition as we do this study. The ambition, I think, is for us to know more about God. I think the time demands that we have an operating understanding. Uh, uh, that is a, a, a knowledge of God that, that source itself in the truth of God that act as an anchor in our lives that hold us in these very troubling waters that we live in. It is so easy to be distracted or to be discouraged by what we see. But God is greater than what we see. And he has called us to walk by faith and not by sight. That you and I should never make a determination about our spirituality or what God is doing based upon what we see. But rather based upon what he has said and what God has said is revealed for us in 66 books, 40 different authors. So knowledge is an essential part, I believe, of learning about God. The theology proper is just a part of the process of learning about God and God's purposes. Second of all, as we study uh, theology proper, we're developing a, a deeper and more meaningful relationship with God. Amen. You cannot relate to that which you do not know. So knowledge always precedes the relationship. That you and I need to get to know God because he desires to be in relationship with us. That is God who in eternity past made a determination that he would have a relationship with those to whom he created, you and I. And that relationship is defined for us within the word of God. God is in fellowship with those who have received Jesus for the pardon of their sins. That act of pardon by God 
opens to us the relationship that we need to have with him. A relationship that defines for us meaning and purpose. Our destiny is in the hands of God and to the degree or to the extent that we are rightly connected with God through this newfound relationship is through the ability that we can understand and know our purpose. Amen. Amen. So meaning in life is tied to our relationship with God. And then the third thing that comes out of knowledge of God and relationship with God, the third thing is obedience. Obedience. That God expects for us to obey him. You see, right now, men are in rebellion towards God. Adam's act of eating off of the tree that he was forbidden not to eat from was an act of rebellion. And that rebellion has produced a corresponding consequence of separation from God. The moment you eat from that tree, you will surely die. And it was a spiritual death that man entered into. But God being rich in his love for us, even while we were dead in our sins and, transgress and transgression, made us alive together in Christ Jesus. And so he, seeing our dilemma, answered that dilemma by offering Christ as a sacrifice. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. He offered Christ as a means by which to lift from us the separation. We're no longer alienated and separated from him because of sin, but we have been brought into a relationship with him based upon what God had predetermined in the councils of eternity for you to be a part of the family of God. And that relationship has produced for us an understanding of who we are juxtaposed to who he is as Lord and Master and master suggests that he is uh, operating as a Lord in our lives and we are slaves to Christ. Doulos. We are slaves to Christ and as slaves to Christ we are to be obedient. To obey, the Bible says, is better than sacrifice. Chuck Colson says in his book, Loving God, and I often quote this because I believe it, it ought to frame for us an understanding of what the expectations are. He says the very nature of the obedience that God requires of us is that it be given without regard to circumstances or results. Without regard to circumstances, no matter what circumstances that you may be facing. Adverse, easy, pleasy, whatever it may be, God says, obey me. And oftentimes it's easy to obey God when things are going well. Sometimes it can be a distraction when things are going well. Amen. It's so good you think you don't need God anymore. You got money in the bank. You know, I got friends. You know, everybody loves me. They think I'm wonderful. And you become somewhat detached from God because of your successes. He says no matter whether the circumstances are good or bad. Now in bad times you would think that that's when people turn away from God. But most people turn to God in bad times. Oh yeah when it gets outside their capacity to do anything about. If you don't have any answers it's easy to say God oh God help me. And when he helps you say thank you God I'll see you next time I need you. That's not what God is talking about. He says you obey me in the good times and in the bad times. Right? And now the other part is this. Without regard to results. Now that's the one that catches most of us. I know early in my ministry. I asked God is this what this is all about? Are you sure you want me here? Because the results were marginal to none. Marginal to none. And he reminded me, I didn't call you to results, Brother Broden. I called you to obedience. I called you to obedience. And so Colson captured it very well. 
that the very nature of the obedience that God requires of us is that it be given without regard to circumstances, no matter what you see. That's why the Bible says we walk by faith and not by sight. It's not what you see that matters. It's who you know. And knowledge of God takes you beyond just a, a kind of ethereal, arm's length knowledge of God, but an intimate, personal knowledge of God. That's epigonosco. Personal, experiential knowledge of God. Without regard to circumstances or results. Men and women, the hour demands that we know our God that we're relating to him on his terms and not yours and that you're obedient and obedience God expects for us to be routinely daily practice you know I, I you know I, I took a, a class in French when I was in high school I, I took it and, and you know they you know they didn't think I could could handle it so you know I was in there on uh, well, we're going to let you try basis. And so I, I went in there and I learned the vocabulary and, and words and took the examination and I passed it. I took the examination. The teacher said, you passed. You did pretty good. And after I passed it, I said, well, you know, shoot, I, I, I'm better than they think they are. And I didn't try that hard anymore. I just said, I proved to you that I could do it. And that's what's what, what obedience looks like for some of us. We do it, we obey God in this area. You say, well, I did it. Well, God, you see I can be obedient, but, you know, I don't need to be as diligent or consistent about it. And then we're on and off in our relationship with God, and God says, no, no, daily. Let me ask you a question. What's your devotional life look like? Is it consistent? Is it an everyday exercise? Are you studying God's word daily? To you parents, young people, are you consistent about representing Christ to your children? Not only in bedtime prayers, but actually reading the scriptures to them. And better than that, modeling Christianity. And how you treat your wife. And how you treat your husband. You see, obedience is something that I think all of us need to take a close look at in our lives. Yeah, you may be obedient in not missing church. The Bible says, forsake not the assembling of the brethren. You show up. Amen. Thank God for that. You're doing that. And the Bible says, honor me with your tithe and offering. Some of you are very good about tithing and offering. Others of you got some work to do in that area. But God says, I want you all the way in. All the way in. And may I say to you right now, all hands on deck. Amen. All hands on deck. We're living in a time when, when peripheral Christianity will not work. It will not produce results. And when you are peripheral, you are exposed. And exposure means that Satan sees weakness in your life and he will attack you at the point of your weaknesses. If you're inconsistent, he'll broaden that inconsistency. If you're on and off in your relationship with God, he'll broaden the off. He'll keep you on the off position. And I'm telling you, I'm seeing that right now. In Christendom right now. And there's a screaming need for us to be rightly connected with God. And so those three things, knowledge, relationship, and obedience to the word of God is required. And so studying theology proper. And theology proper is the study of God and his attributes it focuses in on God the Father and we study him and we see what he's all about part of that study is to study 
the doctrine of the Trinity. The doctrine of the Trinity. Now, the doctrine of the Trinity is a, is a teaching that is unique to Scripture. Unique to Scripture, the Word of God. Both in the Old and New Testament. Now, let me hasten to say this. The word Trinity is not found in Scripture. You're not going to find Trinity in the Scripture. But because you don't find that word doesn't mean that the Bible doesn't teach about the Trinity. It certainly teaches about the Trinity. And so let's go over some of the things that the Bible says about the Trinity in order to reinforce in us that we know that this Scripture uh, uh, is in the Word of God, that the Scriptures speak to the Trinity. The Bible does three things I want to point your attention to. The Bible recognizes three as God. It recognizes three as God. It recognizes three distinct persons. Three distinct persons. And the Bible reveals three as one essence or one in essence one in essence theologians call it the same in substance and distinct in subsistence the same in substance in existence and distinct in subsistence they are distinct in subsistence remember as we study the trinity understand this it is only to the degree that you and I can understand what God has revealed about himself. God is inscrutable and incomprehensible. What do we mean by that? Because we are finite and God is infinite, there is an impossibility for us to understand infinitude. But we can understand what God has revealed. And he's revealed certain aspects about himself I believe that reinforces our capacity to connect with him. That's all God wants us to do, is to trust him. It's to trust him. I heard a theologian say this the other day, and it was very profound when he said it. And I shared this at prayer time. He says, it is irrational not to trust God. It is irrational. That means you're out side of your normal thinking when you're not trusting God you're crazy why because God is good is what he said God is good now when he says when we say God is good we're saying that God is goodness in perfection in perfection he's perfectly good and he's good all the time and so me trusting him is trusting him to do good in my life and if he's doing good in my life, I'm receiving good at its perfection. It's irrational not to trust God. What are you doing? Who are you trusting? You need to be trusting God. And so God is inscrutable. He is incomprehensible. Understand that as we study about the triune God. He's inscrutable and incomprehensible now let's look at this the word trinity is not found in the bible but the idea of the trinity is clearly taught within i want you to take your bibles with me and turn to john chapter 6 john chapter 6 when you get to John chapter 6, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to verse 27. Amen. Verse 27. If I can get there. John chapter 6 and verse 27. The scriptures read like this. I'll give you a few moments to get there. John chapter 6 and verse 27. Now I want you to call your attention to what is recorded here and Jesus is speaking and he says do not work for the food which perishes but for the food which endures to eternal life here again is a priority for believers let me just stop here and just say this parenthetically 
that there are seven P's that God uh, gives to us that reinforces faith. And I'll talk about this at another time. I have a podcast and I, I did this podcast back in 15, but I want to draw these seven P's out for you. Number one is God gives us power. Power to do what he called us to do. God gives us provision. All our provision comes from him. He is Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. God has purpose. My destiny is tied to his purpose. Amen. Power. Provision. Purpose. He gives us peace. My peace I give to you. Not as the world give peace, but my peace. He gives us protection. Thou, O Lord, art a shield about me. My glory and the lifter of my head. Amen. And then God ought to be our priority. Am I right about it? God ought to be my priority. Let's see, that's six, isn't it? And there's a seventh one. And I can't remember it. There's a seventh one. We got power, priority, peace, provision, purpose, protection. And then the seventh one is presence I will never leave you nor will I forsake you he is an ever present help in times of trouble somebody knows that that's seven P's of faith seven P's of faith but notice he says this do not work for the food which perishes but for the food which endures to eternal life for you people who are here today that believe that God is on par with everything else. No, he isn't. He's above everything else. He is the creator of all things. And he is deserving of your time and your energy and your commitment. He is your priority. What is... What is competing with God in your life right now sometimes our children that he by the way he gave us those children and we take them and elevate them above God wait a minute hold up there partner sometimes it's your spouse I just love her so much I, do, I just worship the air she breathes I mean that's good I'm glad you love, the, love her like that the Bible says love her as Christ loved the church but she doesn't take priority of God and neither does he. Some of us, your job. Some of us, is just I take priority over God. Me, myself, and I. Well, you know, you get in trouble. But he says, eat the food for what? Eternal life. Eternal. Hear, 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 hear the word. Hear what he says. But for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him the Father God has set his seal. On him. Now we see uh, what I want to point out in this passage. That God here is identified as the Father. We see that, don't we? God the Father. Now go with me to the next scripture. I want you to see the next one. Next scripture is John 3, 16. No, let's go to John chapter 1 John chapter 1 and verse 1 when you get there say amen amen, amen. John chapter 1 and verse 1 the Bible says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God okay so we see here now we got God the Father, who is God. It says God the Father. Now we have God the world. Now, who is who, the word, rather? Who's the word? Go down to verse 14. Verse 14 says, And the word, this word that's in verse 1, And the word became what? Flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory, glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and full of truth. And so what we see is the word is God and the word is Jesus, the son of God. So now we have God, the father is God. Now we got God, the word, Christ is God. So we got two gods here. 
All right? There's the third one. And the third one, go to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. When you get to Acts chapter 5, I want you to see this. 3 and 4. Follow along. We're, we're, this is teaching. We're teaching now on the Trinity. That, that the idea of the Trinity is within the scriptures. The word Trinity is not there, but the idea is there. So far we see God the Father, God the Word. Now there's a third one. Let's take a look at it. But Peter said to Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart and you have not lied to men but to God? Now you see in verse 3 he says you have lied to the Holy Spirit. Then he goes on to say this lying you did was lying to God. The Holy Spirit is God. Now if we just leave it right there we got three gods. That the Bible is saying. Three gods. God the Father. God the Son. God the Holy Spirit. But the Bible didn't leave us there. <laughs> Praise God he didn't leave us there. And so the Bible recognizes three as God. Now secondly, the Bible recognizes that these three are distinct personalities. Distinct personalities. Now we go to John 3.16. John 3.16. Amen. They're distinct. John 3 16 it says for God so loved the world you you know this by heart for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life who gave the son the father gave the son he's distinct from the son he's not the same as the son it says but he gave the son am i right about it the father gave the son there are two here and they are separate now let's go to john 14. let's go to john 14. when you get to 14 i want you to look at verse 16 and we'll go to 17 as well jesus is praying and he says this, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. I will give you another, the Father will give another helper. In other words, he's given me, and I'm the Son, and I'm God, but he's going to give you another helper, a paraclete. That he may be with you forever. That is the Spirit of Truth. Whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you who is giving the helper the father who's talking about it the giving the son three distinct persons this is taught clearly in scripture Clearly in scripture, three distinct persons, all are present here in this particular passage of scripture. Now, one more, and one that you are familiar with, go to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, when you get there, let's look at verse 19. Verse 19, we're teaching on on the Trinity that's being taught in Scripture that Christians everywhere believe in a triune God a triune God now that's not true for everyone who's a Christian 
Now, Unitarians are not Christians because they don't believe in a triune God. The Judeo Jewish religion is not Christian because they do not believe in a triune God. And neither is Jehovah Witnesses. They're not Christians. Christians everywhere believe God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Whether you're Catholic or Protestant. Now listen. Matthew chapter 28, 19. Are you there? Notice. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the names of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Did I read that right? Did I read that right? I didn't read that right. Take a look at it again. I said in the names with an S. It didn't say that. It says baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The the there is a definite article. The Father, one person. The Son, another person. The Holy Spirit, all three. Definite article, separating them. We serve a triune God. And if you don't believe that, then maybe you need to hear what the Bible is teaching here. And it's clear. And it's distinct. The Bible reveals three as one in essence. One in essence. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Old Testament. And by the way, the, tri the triune God is explicitly taught within the New, Old, New Testament, but explicit, no, explicit in the New Testament, implicit in the Old Testament. And we're going to see that in a few moments. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Look at verse 4. And this is the Shema Israel Adonai Elohim Adonai Ehad. Hear, O Israel, Shema Israel, the Lord is our God. It seems at this point it contradicts what we're teaching in the Old Testament. It seems that way, doesn't it? Elohim. Elohim is plural. The Lord our God. Plural. But that's, I don't want to get in that right now. I want to take a look at that last part. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is our God. The Lord is one. One. The Hebrew word there is Ehad. Ehad represents what is called a compound unity. The bringing together of things and unifying them. Ehad. Compared to Yahid, which is another word for unity or one in Hebrew, which means absolute unity. Compound unity, absolute unity. Let's look at the Ehad and how it is used that justifies the compound, the coming together of diff or distinct things. Notice Genesis chapter 1 verse 5. Now we're going to move around, so I want you to move with me, because I want you to see pastor's not making this stuff up. All right? Genesis chapter 1 verse 5. The Bible reads, God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. And there was evening. And there was morning. One day. The word one. The word there in Hebrew is ehad. Ehad. Compound. The coming together of two distinct things. That is ehad. The day is composed of evening and and morning. One day is composed of evening and morning. Eha. Eha. Some of y'all looking like, what in the world? You're getting a seminary education right now. You're becoming theologians. 
Amen. Amen. Let's go to another one. Look at Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24. Verse 24. Now he says, for this reason, this is Adam speaking. He says, and for this reason, man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become Eha. Two distinct flesh. She's an independent. He's an independent person. He says, but they become Ehad. A compound unity. Are you starting to get it now? In, in, in Deuteronomy 6 and 4, it says, Hear, O Israel, Shema Israel, Adonai Elohim, Adonai Ehad. The Lord our God is one compound. We say there's three that are coming together in unity. They didn't see it. But because we can study language now and we have the prompting and the teaching of the Holy Spirit within us, we can see what God intended, what they lost. You see, they were so busy trying to not have a polytheistic uh, uh, faith in many gods that they were championing the fact one God, one God. And they miss Eha, a compound. You see that, Rudy? A compound inside their Shema, Israel, Adonai, Elohim, Adonai, Eha. Eha, that's your God. Yeah, that's your God. But there's another word for unity or one in Genesis chapter 22 and 2. Genesis chapter 22 and 2. But this one is not Eha. It is Yahid. Yahid 22 and 2. Notice. Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. I want to go to verse 2. I'm in verse 7 there. I want to, I want to make my point in verse 2. He said, Take now your son. This is God speaking to Abraham. Your only son, your only son, the word there for only is Yahid. Your only one, the only one, uniquely one. There's only one Isaac. There's not two, three, or four. Absolute unity. He is one. This word Yahid is never used in describing who God is. Whenever God is raised up, is Ehad, a compound unity, not an absolute unity. Know that in Scripture. If you know the languages, you can get to that. You can get to that understanding. There has been a number of rabbis in the Jewish faith who have been shown this, and they have become believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because they didn't see it. Do you know the Bible says that there is a blindness that God has given to them? That God has blinded them to the truth? Until the times of the Gentiles is up? Why did God do that? Because they had their opportunity and they rejected it. God says, okay, I have a purpose for you guys. But now I'm going to put you on hold. I'm going over here to the Gentiles. And that's where Paul's ministry primarily was, to the Gentiles. And you and I are the recipients of God's movement to get us out of darkness into the light. And we are now children of the light. And Paul says, walk not as unwise men, but as wise men, because the days are evil. How many know days are evil? Amen. And so that requires wisdom. And the Bible says, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Don't ask broken, because I can't give it to you. But God can give it to you. Listen here. What we see here is that he says, your only son, Yahid, the only one, 
The only one you have. Wasn't talking about Ishmael. Talking about Isaac. Isaac. Blood of his blood and bone of his bone. And so what we see is that this word sort of implies the unity or the trinity in the Old Testament frame. But there's another word I think that we can see in Isaac chapter 48. This one, you know, it's, it's, it's absolutely breathtaking if you take a look at it. Because it represents the trinity clearly taught within the word of God in the Old Testament frame. Go to Isaac, uh, Isaiah, I said Isaac, Isaiah chapter 48. Isaiah chapter 48. When you get to 48, notice 12 through 14. Isaiah chapter 48, verses 12 through 14. I want you to stay with me on this. We're going to take this one slow. And he says, listen to me. I always like to stop whenever I see the word listen. Because listen requires of us to be active in our listening. You, you know, you can look like you're listening, but you're not. You can be looking at a person while they're speaking, and your mind is somewhere else. And some of you right now, you, you're, you're thinking, how long will this dude go on? I wish that he would hurry up and conclude. I'm not understanding anything he's saying anyway. All right? That's not listening. Listening, I learn, active listening, when engaged in conversation with your neighbor, active listening is that you listen for the period in the sentence. That's new to some of you. Right? Because as soon as you get an idea, you blurt it right in, whether they're talking or not. No, what the hell? And you get right in. You're not listening for them to, to come to the conclusion of their idea or their thinking. That's active listening. So when you say, when the Bible says, listen to me, that means everything else stops and you lock in on what God is saying. We said that the word in the Greek is, is akuo. Akuo means pay attention to, hearken unto the voice that is being represented at that time. In the same way you would whenever you buy your power ticket, and a lot of you went out and bought that, that power ticket because it's $348 million right now. And you can't win unless you play it. So I'm sure some of us went out and played. I bought me a ticket the other day. I said, well, Lord, if you want to bless me this way, the only way I know you're going to bless me is I buy the ticket. <laughs> So you tune into the Powerball uh, channel and they begin to give the number. 45. You look, 45. Now do you think you're going to stop listening at that point and pay attention to what your wife is saying? Or would you say, honey, I'm, I'm listening right now. And you lock in. That's the kind of listening that ought to take place in the life of the believer whenever you are listening to the word of God. Everything else is locked out. And if you're sitting here distracted by what you left on the stove or what's coming on tonight at 7 o'clock, you can't wait to pop some popcorn and get in front of, of Hulu or Netflix or whatever. Then you're not actively listening. The Bible says here, listen to me, O Jacob. Whenever the Bible says, O Jacob is speaking to Israel. His name was changed from Jacob to Israel. He says, listen to me, O Jacob. Even Israel, whom I called, I am he. I am the first. I am also the last. Who was the first and the last? The Omega and the Alpha. God is. God. He says, I am. That's me. Listen to me, Israel. I'm God. I'm God. Listen to this. Surely my hand founded the earth. It was through me that I created all things. And my right hand spread out the heavens. When I call to them, they stand together. Assemble all of you and listen. Who among them has declared these things? Who but God? The Lord loves him. 
He's still speaking. The Lord loves him. Who's speaking? The Alpha and the Omega. He will carry out his goodwill. Pleasure on Babylon. He'll carry out his goodwill and pleasure on Babylon. And his arm will be against the Chaldeans. I, even I, have spoken indeed. I have called him. And I have brought him. And he will make his way successful. Come near to me and listen to this. From the first, I have not spoken in secret. From the time it took place, I was there. And now the Lord God has sent me. Uh-oh. Wait a minute. What's, what, what's happening here? He says, I'm Omega and I am Alpha. I'm the beginning and the ending. That's me. And I created everything. But now the Lord sends me. The Lord sends me and his spirit. If you don't see three there, I don't know what you are looking at. That's Old Testament. That's three. And you and I worship a triune God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And no matter what is being said out there, and a lot is being said, we follow what the Bible says. And the Bible teaches a triune God. Who are you believing? With every head bowed and every eye closed. Father, theology, theology, theology proper causes us to study even the triune God. And what we're discovering, Father, is that you are a God of excellence. That Jesus is your son, sent by the Godhead, God the Father, for the purpose of reconciliation and redemption. You have reconciled us to yourself. And we are grateful and thankful, O oh God, that you've allowed us to know, that you've allowed us to have a relationship with you, and that you are allowing us to be obedient. And Father, it's not incidental that we say allow. Because Jesus makes it clear. Apart from me, you can do nothing. We can't serve you. We can't worship you. We can't obey you unless you are in us working obedience out. In Jesus' name. Amen. I trust that you have been challenged to think differently. That this lesson today on the Trinity, the Holy Trinity, has given you confidence that the Bible teaches it. It is implied in the Old Testament and explicitly taught within the New Testament. I pray that that serves as an anchor for you and your faith. We begin by saying knowledge relationship and obedience is required of us in these last and evil days the bible says it very clearly it expressly says the bible says that in the last days some will fall away from the faith by paying attention to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons hello deceiving spirits and we're living in a time when fakery is the reality of the world in which we live. We're being deceived on every hand. But it is the filter of the word of God that gives us the ability to see as he sees, know as he has made known so that we might do what he called us to do. So the word of God is important. Don't negate the study of it. Hide it in your hearts. The Bible says, thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against you. Amen. It's time now for us to have a reasonable explanation and understanding of our faith. God, we bless you and thank you for the lesson today. We pray that those who are listening online will continue to hear the truth of God's word. Amen.
Now listen, you, you can write me and let me know what you think about the lesson at 1321 Rowan Avenue uh, in Dallas, Texas, 75223. And if you care to make a contribution or sow a seed into our ministry, use that address and send that donation to us. We can use it here at the church. Thank you for listening in. God bless you.